so uh, there's a question uh, about AWS in general. And I am going to pull it up. Uh, in case you're wondering what I'm talking about, we actually are going to, we can watch a, a video on this um, and talk about Lambda and why AWS is a leader on so many levels. Uh, but I do really think everybody needs to understand AWS Lambda, which kind of revolutionized um, a lot of things. Uh, it's become something everybody has copied elsewhere. I'm trying to find the promotional video about Lambda. Uh, it's a it's it's a really good summary of what uh, Amazon is about in general. Um, let me change my scene to just the browser. And uh, okay, so let's find the video on it, and then we're gonna watch the whole thing, and I'll, I'll talk during it. All right, so getting started with AWS Lambda, what it is, why do you use it, and why does this relate to AWS in general? I think the AWS Lambda product most perfectly um, describes why AWS has an, such an amazing value proposition for the rest of the world. Um, and then we can talk about whether whether that's a value proposition you want to buy into um, in general into the whole AWS ecosystem. That's a separate conversation. So let's start by understanding AWS's most, I suppose, um, one of their most modern offerings, one of the most disruptive offerings. They tend to disrupt the industry a lot. So let's watch. Yeah. When you're building applications, you want them to deliver a great experience for your users. Maybe you want your application to generate in-app purchase options during a gaming session, rapidly validate street address updates, or make image thumbnails available instantly after a user uploads photos. To make this magic happen, your application needs back-end code that runs in response to events like image uploads, in-app activity, website clicks, or sensor outputs. Events. Those are but events. managing the infrastructure to host and execute backend code requires you to size, provision, and scale a bunch of servers, manage operating system updates, apply security patches, and then monitor all this infrastructure for performance and availability. Yeah, Wouldn't monitoring. it be nice if you could just focus on building great applications without having to spend lots of time managing servers? Hashtag serverless. Introducing AWS Lambda. AWS Lambda is a compute service that runs your backend code in response to events such as object uploads to Amazon S3 buckets, updates to Amazon DynamoDB tables, That's the one they kicked data the in Amazon Kinesis streams, or in-app activity. Once you upload your code to Lambda, the service handles all the capacity, scaling, patching, and administration of the infrastructure to run your code and provides visibility into performance by publishing real-time metrics and logs to Amazon CloudWatch. All you need to do is write the code. Mm -hmm. AWS Lambda is very low cost and does not require any upfront investment. When you use AWS Lambda, That's you're simply charged computing. a low fee per request and for the time your code runs, measured in increments of 100 milliseconds. Getting started with AWS Lambda is easy. There are no new languages, tools, or frameworks to this learn. Is you can use nice. any third-party library, even native ones. They're not kidding. The code you run on AWS Lambda is called a Lambda function. You just upload your code as a zip file or design it in the integrated development environment in the AWS Management Console. No. Or you can select from a list of function samples pre-built for common use cases, such as image conversion, file compression, and change notifications. Yeah, but no. And built-in support for the AWS SDK makes it easy to call other AWS mm -hmm. services. It's true. Once your function is loaded, you select the event source to monitor, such as an Amazon S3 bucket or Amazon DynamoDB mm -hmm. table, and within For a few events. seconds, yeah. Lambda will be ready to trigger your function automatically when an event occurs. This is important. With Lambda, we'll any event this. can trigger event your function, making it easy to build applications that respond quickly to new information. To learn more about AWS Lambda, visit our website and you can get your first Lambda function up and running with a few clicks in the AWS Management Console. And with the AWS Free Tier, you can try Lambda for free. All right, so let's talk about AWS Lambda for a bit. Um, the term Lambda uh, is a direct reference to Lambda Mathematics, which is based on functions. I'm, I'm, this is a question more for, for somebody who's a mathematician. But um, 
uh, for example, if you know Python, you know that you can write a one-line anonymous function. If you know an anonymous function is a function without a name. It's a it's a function that can be passed around as a um, in in a proper language in a language that supports first class functions. And there's another term, ding ding. Uh, first class functions are functions that can be passed around just like anything else you can put in a variable. They're just another data type. Why does all this matter? Because AWS Lambda is that idea at a macro scale. That means it's functional programming, and functional programming is is fundamentally based on functions. Things go in, things come out. There's no side effects. You just everything's contained within the function, nice and pretty. It's a lot easier to test than object-oriented programming. And so AWS Lambda is 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 directly referring to this idea. Um, things go in, things come out. Um, tr- events are triggered. Um, the functional model lends itself really well to the event model. And the way we, we'll talk about events at some other time, but um, events, uh, the best way to think of events is when, then, as opposed to imperative kind of coding step by step, which is if, then. Um, so, you know, there's if then, which is kind of the way we've been doing it forever. And we, we are seeing more and more event driven programming. So web programming is all event driven. Um, and event, event programming is when then, and there's lots of reasons for that. uh, But, um, one of them is, you know, speed for concurrency, um, how to get around bottlenecks of like single CPUs and such. Um, but the, the really amazing thing about what Amazon did here, and this is their latest innovation, it actually um, ties on many other things, um, is that they have applied the functional paradigm, which is becoming popular because of its efficiency, uh, to to the IT world, and and they've 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 spawned the entire serverless movement. And I think I don't know for sure, but I'm almost positive they started it. And they've done that a couple times. So, I mean, there's some great minds over at Amazon. Full disclosure, I did interview and I seriously thought about having them move me over there. And there's so much, their recruiters are really fun to talk to, actually. Um, and, I mean, it's super tempting because it's one of the biggest come from country. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to go to AWS. I would work at AWS. I would work at Amazon way before I would work for Google. Um, but anyway, so the... Uh, the lambda. So lambda is this idea. Lambda directly refers to um, the you know that lambda symbol. Uh, that symbol is even used in uh, calculus, and um, not calculus. Um, it's it's used uh, all over the place. But it's it, Haskell too, I think. Um, I'm not a big functional programmer. I was raised on OOP, but I but I but when you generally start to program uh, when you're first a beginner you you're already you think naturally in sort of functional terms because those are the terms that in math you generally would think about so how does this relate to all of amazon cloud um well if we go back into the video we can see um there's a few uh times here where they they point to all of the the different th- the greek symbol lambda right and um so there's the greek symbol lambda uh, it means there's something goes in, something comes out, and and it's it's basically it represents a transformation of the data, or, or the thing coming in, and um, so so this is this is what they bring to the table. They have everything, you know. They've taken care of all of the hassle. Uh, they have all the infrastructure, and for better or worse, right? So, uh, and let's talk about elastic computing. So. This thing that they that they talked about with dialing stuff up and down, and you change the costs, that is their primary bring to market kind of product. They are the first company, as far as I know, um, to say, "Oh, you only need one CPU for today. Great, you need two. How many MIPS do you need?" And they charge you based on how much you're using, and that that was really revolutionary. Because up until that point, you had to buy, you know, hardware and commit and you had to get more hardware. And then if you didn't have enough, particularly if you had a really high you know, performing thing, this is why this kind of thing is why, you know, Netflix and, and, you know, huge, huge uh, products are on Amazon. It's also why, you know, a large part of the government, including the NSA and CIA are store their stuff on Amazon services. 
So, so this is um, this is the idea of elastic computing, and that really brought it to the table. So they they provide every service you can imagine. They have DNS, they have storage, they have databases, um, and they have, uh, and now they have you know this Lambda product. Uh, the crazy thing is, is you can actually get all of the benefit of Lambda. So just like any time the world gets disrupted, Netlify was the first um, provider that I know of to provide Lambda built in to Jamstack. So this is a way for you to have a website and benefit from Lambda. So let's say you have a thing that you want to do that requires a little bit more processing power than you would have uh, just using the front end only through with Reactor View, and so you want to add something to it, and so you're like, man, I need something on the back end, or I need a database, I need an extra thing on the back end, but I don't want to put a whole server up because then I have to do all that stuff. So you would reach for something like Netlify Actions, which are encapsulated Lambda queries, uh, so you don't even have to have a Lambda account; you don't have to have an Amazon account at all, and. Um, they so you can search so they have their their whole shtick is they want to make it easier for everybody to make websites without servers and they've coined the term jamstack uh, javascript apis and markup or markdown and the serverless framework in aws lambda um so they have a, a bunch of stuff on here but basically what they do is they encapsulate um their whole thing is that you really just need to make a front end all of the stuff you could possibly want on the back end has already been made for you. And I largely agree with that. So uh, you can use databases on, you know, Firebase or whatever. If you need, if you need payment, you can use Stripe or PayPal. If you need, you know, comments, you use Discuss. If you need, um, and if you need some sort of customized action, you use their encapsulated AWS Lambda functions. So, you don't even have to enter into the Amazon ecosystem to benefit from the use of Amazon Lambda functions. This is such a powerful idea for the IT world, particularly the small to medium size um, sort of IT shops, that it's been picked up by GitHub. So GitHub now has um, Actions. Actions are... I, I, I'm still getting my head around Actions. I don't fully understand them. Somebody correct me if I get it wrong. But... Um, Actions are kind of the combination of, I don't believe they're directly Lambda functions. I think actions are more designed to compete with GitHub, with GitLab's um, continuous delivery thing. And that's a whole different topic. Um, but my, I, don't, I need to confirm this, I don't know. But they're, they, I know that they have something like um, uh, uh, the Lambda function from Netlify. I think they might call it services, actually can't remember um if somebody knows they can comment on it and correct me apologize for not knowing that offhand i'm not interested in it because i've been using netlify <laughs> netlify is you know is perfect for that um if i want something more than that then i'll spin up my own server on you know heroku or digital ocean and i'll use that for my rest api query you know or graphql or database or whatever i need that needs a back end um and so so that's that's Lambda. So um, uh, Amazon, you could you could argue pretty strongly that Amazon influenced the entire industry to adopt an elastic computing model. So um, you can also go with get um, let's see, uh, DigitalOcean, which I Di DigitalOcean is my favorite cloud provider um, because they cater to developers. And they know they can't go up against Azure and they can't go up against, um, which I know nothing about, by the way, um, and they can't go up against um, Amazon. Amazon's the big gorilla. So their whole shtick um, at DigitalOcean is, here, welcome to the developer cloud. Uh, their UI just absolutely trounces any UI you've ever seen in in Amazon, or I would imagine even Azure. I mean, it is absolutely elegant. It is fantastic. And, you know, when you're a developer and you have to use a GUI, you don't want to mess around. Um, you know, Rackspace had a, had a decent one, but no, they, they didn't really keep up. I, I was on them for a long time. Um, and so, but the DigitalOcean thing is really great. It's all, it's all SSD 
uh, storage and you can deploy uh, like a server in a few seconds. So this idea of um, having elast elastic computing that's on demand and changes depending on your needs. So let's say you're having, this is a scenario I actually have, um, I have kids here who run Minecraft servers up on DigitalOcean and they'll have to compile their um, spigot servers um, using build tools uh, on their local laptops and then copy them over because there's not even enough RAM on their droplets which have like, you know, one gigabyte of RAM. Um, I really like that the whole cloud thing has made people concerned with uh, performance again. Because if you use, you know, two gigabytes of RAM, you pay 10 bucks a month. So it's, it's, it's put a, it's, it's put a, re a revised focus on efficiency and writing good code and not, not writing bloated backend code or whatever. And I, I appreciate that because and mobile did the same thing, by the way. So mobile, before mobile, everybody was getting really sloppy with their resources because everybody had a desktop. And so you were pretty sure you were going to have this big old thing. And then along comes, you know, DigitalOcean and mobile. And all of a sudden everybody's like ridiculously focused on efficiency and small load times and compression and everything. And so that, that constraint made for a lot better coding. And you get that now in the cloud environment too. But the elastic idea, so say my, 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 you know, friend here's got a Minecraft server he wants to run. He's got a party coming up. He wants to bump up the number, the amount of RAM. He's definitely using DigitalOcean so he can get their full backbone connection for bandwidth. That's not an issue. Minecraft is really dependent, by the way, on uh, bandwidth. It's it's the number one limiter, even beyond RAM. So, um, so yeah, he fires it up there, and and, and you know, people connect, and he he bumps up the RAM to like four or five gig. And so, you know, nobody crashes and it's really great. And this party's gone and so he can turn around back down and he's charged accordingly. That's the idea of um, Elastic Computing, Elastic Resources Platform as a Service. And Amazon, I think it's pretty safe to say they champion that idea that now exists everywhere in the industry. Um, to be fair, IBM was doing something similar on the mainframe since the 90s. Um, they would take the mainframe and they would chop it up into tiny little um, uh, Linux machines uh, that you could, you know, spin up on demand. And um, they really did it first. They just didn't get credit. <laughs> you know, they did. They did it first and they did it on the mainframe. So it was like, oh, mainframe, nobody wants to talk about that. And But they actually did it. And they've been doing that for a long time. They've been spent, they've been chopping up that the mainframe computing power into little little OSs in different ways for a very very long time. You can make the case that they're they should have won the cloud computing thing because they've been doing it for so long um, with the mainframe, but they didn't. They definitely lost Amazon. Uh, I'm reading a comment here. Um, there is a comparison of AWS Lambda versus Azure Function on I I I. I am on demand. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let me pull that up. Um, this is a really the only race in IT that's worth following right now, as far as I'm concerned. Cybersecurity is a big deal too, and and machine learning and quantum computing. All those, everyone says, who's winning the race between the big ones on these major major things? But I'm convinced the number one race is who's going to win the cloud because and hopefully it won't be just one person that wins the cloud there'll at least be three of them and this kind of um leads into a conversation about why i think cloud computing and having only one or two or three providers is super duper dangerous and it um it actually um goes against adam ruins um everything does uh, a, a thing on this i don't remember the one but um uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to have that much of our computing power in two or three providers. The whole point of the internet is that we could withstand an attack if somebody took down one or two uh, routers would be fine. The packets would reroute. But um, if you take out one or two or three of these, all of which, by the way, are centered in, I mean, they have redundancies, but not as good as you would think. God, if, if I had a dollar for every time I read somebody losing data because their Amazon storage had failed them and they said, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> I'd have like $10. <laughs> but, you know, it was like too many eggs in one basket. Yeah. And, you know, that's the nature of it, right? The nature of it is for, for good innovation to win out and it's very competitive. But is that going to be good for the internet? I, I don't think so. I think it's super bad for the internet, for the whole for our humanity in general. Um, and so I'm, 
I, I, so I, I think I've explained pretty much what AWS is at this point and what they provide. Um, um, and, uh, you know, the race for the cloud, by the way, you can tell what companies are going to die based on which ones don't have cloud offerings. So Apple, I, I, this is one of the key indicators. What does Apple have? This is a different video altogether. At one point, Apple was highly diver diversified. They had, um, you know, they had the app store, they had iTunes. Those were different things, by the way, at the time they had iPhones, they had Mac OS and their hardware. And so, you know, four, at least four really big branches and they were really highly diversified. But if you look at them now, what do they have? All they have left is iOS. Uh, their Mac OS division is, is now reports to the iOS people. That's why you see things like completely ridiculous um, little gadgets, you know, little, little useless battery draining things on their laptops. It's why they got rid of the escape key, which without ever asking a VI user if they needed the escape key. So they're making a lot of stupid decisions because they they basically are just thumbing their nose at their whole Mac OS stuff, all their hardware. And all, I mean, they, they've tried to put some energy back into it recently, but for the most part, they're done. And um, their app store, they still have some things going on in their app store and iTunes. iTunes was a massive thing, right? Not so much anymore. Spotify obliterated it. Not just Spotify, but streaming music in general. Um, they didn't really have an answer to that. So it's gone. That income is gone. Um, app Store. They still have a little bit of money coming in for the App Store, but people are waking up and going, this App Store stuff is shit. I have to pay you $99 a, a year just to have the, the possibility of you not letting my app get published. You know, there's like, if you look at the App Store, there's like, what, less than 1% or, or all the thing. Everything else is just there. And by the way, it's none of it's being updated. So it's this massive graveyard for apps. And that's another thing. Why do we, does the world want three or four app stores? So the whole, the whole app store idea was a fail and it, it's thank God for progressive web apps because the idea of giving all the control of all of the IT of all that information over to three companies who are producing apps instead of producing web content and web apps and stuff for the web platform was bad for humanity. I'm glad to see that die. So that's on its way out. It's dying. And so Apple is seriously scrambling to add a second thing because their only thing right now is their iPhone. And that's under direct attack from Huawei. That's why the, you know, Tim Apple, as Trump calls him, is sitting next to Trump no matter what, because he's like, if we lose our iPhone income, bye bye A lot of people don't know this about Apple. They were a trillion dollar company and they got all kinds of press for being so evaluated and they lost half of that in the next year. So go look back, go look at it. It's insane. Um, they're in massive free fall and they're trying to cater. There's a higher end users. Now they're, they're coming out with computers. I mean, you can watch Linus or, uh, or Linus on this, I guess is his name, the one who does all the reviews and he can, he'll just confirm everything I'm saying objectively They're They, they don't know they've lost their way and they're going down. And why is that? Because they didn't have a cloud offering. They tried and then their cloud got hacked big time. Remember that? I mean, they're, they're an absolute failure of a company on the IT front. They, for a full month, you could log into any Apple device or computer with a, as admin with no password. They lost the rights to have those advertisements with the PC versus the, the cool hip guy and how secure their system. They lost that, the right to make that claim forever after that. Windows has been hacked and it's got a lot of problems, no doubt, but it's never had the company itself take out the root password or the admin password for a full month. That's never happened. So that, that kind of hubris over at Apple where they make a big billion dollar thing that has open floor plan, which is scientifically proven to be unproductive for developers and the developers hate developers have left over it. And you have a company with that level of hubris and no cloud strategy and eh, cloud. And you, you, you have basically the nineties Microsoft. Eh, the internet's not a thing. Yeah. Screw that. I don't need that much RAM. And the '90s Microsoft almost almost failed also because of it, because of their hubris and Apple's doing it right now, and it's because they, I think a big part of that is they don't have a cloud they don't have a cloud solution. Yeah, thousand dollar for monitor stand. It's actually right when it, when a company gets when they when a company gets that crazy let them eat cake kind of attitude, they're gonna die, they're gonna die, and you know who's gonna kill them? Gen Z. Gen Z's had it. They're like we are tired. Yeah. <laughs> Open floor plan. I don't think management got that memo. Uh, well, I felt like, dude, 
um, the sunglasses are gone. Yeah, I took my sunglasses off because uh, that was mostly a morning thing. Um, these lights, it's funny, in the day it's not so bad. I think it might be because the daylight kind of comes in my little lab here. It's, it's not so jarring. <laughs> you got to understand, I'm a programmer. We're used to like coding in like dark holes. You probably know this. And, um, you know, all of a sudden the live streaming comes on and I got like, like noonday light on me all day. <laughs> so I'm like hiding. Oh no, light, light, bright light. <laughs> it's like, it's like this screen right now. It's like all white. I'm like, give me back my dark reader, please. I mean, there's gotta be some medical reason for that because, you know, already it's already bad for your eyes to stare at a screen all day, let alone stare at a screen that's like seriously going to burn your eyes out. And now I got lights right in my eyes too. So I, I actually, for the first time in my life, I sympathize with the rappers and the starlets and the divas and the Hollywood actors who wear sunglasses all the time <laughs> because <laughs> I'm wearing my, my super cheapo, you know, like pharmacy glasses that will fit over my, um, my glasses like every other old man. <laughs> I think they look cool. You know, God bless Bono for making, you know, obnoxiously large sunglasses cool again but i divert i i, I what is it digress I digress three o'clock i have an hour before my sessions um i think i'm going to wrap up that conversation of amazon i will uh, highlight that tonight uh and go through what i think of cloud but um and i'm going to clip all the way forward to this conclusion right here i do not buy in to the idea of a large cloud with very few competitors. And I think, uh, based on my mantra, what if everybody did it? In this case, it's not what everybody can do. Not everybody can have a cloud, and they've dominated the marketplace. And I still want to believe that, and I'm not the only one, very, very influential people, and I'm going to pull up Oxide. Um, is it Oxide.io, I think? I hope it is. Oh, God damn it. I hope I can find it. It's such a new company. Jess Frazzle, who is quite outspoken and fun and talented and intelligent, and Brian Cantrell. These are two human beings that I would love to meet in real life, but I'm unlikely to. Um, uh, Jess is particularly popular on Twitter. She's a big Docker person over at Microsoft. At least she was, and I believe she left. She's now at Oxide Computer Company, um, let me see if I can find that. So they, the reason I'm bringing this up is because these are some very forward-thinking people. I mean, some of the most forward-thinking people I've ever followed. And from what I can tell, they started their own podcast too. I really suggest people go uh, watch their podcast. I haven't, I've only got through the first uh, one. But um, uh, Brian Kentrell, Brian Kentrell's got to be one of my favorite all-time heroes. Um presenters and if you don't know why um you just need to uh watch his video on whether rush should be used for the operating system i was forever a fan after that i mean he's just the guy is obsessed with even he's the kind of guy who who ordered like a lot of like a lot as in a shipping lot you know like a pallet um, of old computer book manuals just to read through them and study the old boomer tech, you know, books and manual and computer languages. Um, he's just obsessed with it all. He was a CTO of Joint for a while. And um, hyperscale the infrastructure. Um, and so from what I can tell so far, um, this is a relatively new thing, like within the last month or two, I believe they left their other places and they formed this company. And the company is focused on one thing, making small hardware that is basically a competitor to the cloud. And the reason I think this, this tiny company is so important, it's in a garage, is because it's, it's a very significant indicator of the backlash against centralized cloud um, support. So when you have centralized cloud support, you've got, I mean, you know, the kind of offerings um, like we have with Amazon and Azure. Um, and this, by the way, this is an age old pendulum, centralized, decentralized, centralized, decentralized. You can almost, you know, measure the seasons by it. Um, and mainframe, non-desktop, mainframe, desktop. It, it goes back and forth. It's been doing that forever. And this is, I think, the beginning of the pendulum swinging the other way. People are not 
wanting, and, and you can you can give the cryptocurrency stuff credit for this for the whole decentralized web, and that's some good di- sli- slides and dialogues on that. So um, hyperscale infrastructure for the rest of us. So Oxide is building a new kind of server, a true rack scale design, bringing cloud hyperscale innovations around density, efficiency, cost, reliability, manageability, and security to every run and running on-premise computing infrastructure. You see that right there? So you really, really, really want to watch this if you're in IT, especially if you're an IT investor. If you're an IT investor, I believe the money is no longer in cloud offerings. Uh, that we are at the beginning of a movement away from cloud, back to a decentralized on-premise thing. And you, you, you can kind of feel it, the change in the wind in the air because this whole privacy stuff, that's all, it's all kind of coming together. You have NextCloud, which is a, a cloud system you can run on your own. We, I have a, a the guy who just got hired uh, last week um, who has it running NextCloud. He won't even use GitHub or GitLab. He's running GitT out of, his, out of his own system. So you have this idea of decentralization, which is coming from cryptocurrency um, and you know all the distributed apps and all that. That's a big part of it. You have this, like, finally, this mainstream awareness about privacy violations. We're just done with Google being evil. And the rest, um, we're done with a single retail outlet, you know, through Amazon. And so you have this kind of mindset that's that's taking hold that, no, we, we need to put, we need to make solutions that are on-premise that are as easy to use as long, you know, as um, as the cloud. And so we're starting to see that. Thanks for the awesome advice today. I'll be back once more. No, that's fine. Go have some fun at work. Uh, so, so what we see is we see the beginning of this and there's another significant company. So GitLab, one of the reasons that I think GitLab is so important in this, this whole thing is they have basically thumbed their nose at the Silicon Valley approach. Um, they do provide a centralized service, but their primary income, I would guess, I don't know. Although I could know because they've got a very transparent business model. This company has been the subject of um, Harvard Business Review uh, study was recently announced because they are 100% mobile. They're 100% remote. They're really, really transparent. And they're selling a product that um, allows for decentralization. And they coined the term um, uh, Open Core. So it's a, a company to watch. Um and anyway, so they've done the DevOps thing, but why are they, why am I talking about them in terms of, because GitLab can be installed on premise and they, I would say they probably make, I'm guessing, I bet, I bet they make most of their money selling to on-site providers. They're also entirely open source. They had over 4,000 commits, um, last year from people in the community who are supporting their core product. That's not happening at GitHub. You know, uh, GitHub is not an open source product. It's a very close source product. It plays into the Microsoft ecosystem very well. Um, there's advantages to both. That's a different video. But um, my point is, is that this is one of the primary companies and tools in the decentralization market. And the other big one, and this is why I think we need to watch Oxide like a hawk, because if you if you study Jess Frazzle and you study... Um, Brian Cantrell, and you look at their background and you look at what they know. She just is probably one of the world's leading experts on Docker containerization. She runs her whole operating system as a Docker container. There's a great video on that. And then if you see what she, uh, Brian Cantrell's videos about Rust and his obsession about architecture and all of the great minds that he has been around, including, you know, Brian, Brian Kernigan and a bunch of other people that he talks about in his videos, which I would, you know, fall over and faint if I ever met because they're just such amazing human beings for the contributions they've made. Um, and yet, I mean, so he's very plugged into what's coming. In fact, I would go so far as to say that these individuals are akin to the Steve Jobs of our day. They are making, uh, un, they're, they're, they're stepping into areas that are not in the mainstream and they're doing so courageously. I think it's, it's telling that they have a garage in their, in their thing. They've had, they've created a podcast because I think that's probably why they want to get the word out. So I'm happy to talk about them. I'm certainly not a very big, um, uh, person to, I'm not, I'm just barely started streaming. So, 
Um, but yeah, this is the company to watch, Oxide Computer. They are basically give, focused on helping people build their own clouds in ways that are turnkey. Ironically, um, one of the smartest people I have here uh, is was completely hyper-focused on exactly the same thing. I don't want to be dependent on Amazon. I don't want to be dependent on whatever, AWS. And so his entire focus for like two years has been making all the little pieces of something like Oxide Computer. The difference being Oxide's actually making computers themselves. And the idea being that, you know, a company or small company, a business, an individual can say, I want my own cloud. They, they, they download an app or a framework or something and boom, they have their own AWS in their house and it's every bit as secure and they don't have to deal with, you know, software updates and all that. So there is a market for that kind of thing, um, particularly because more and more enterprises are going to want to do this. Um, I think this is the market for that's going to go up the more Amazon gets hacked um, and, and the more cloud solutions prove to not be the really awesome, you know, big old black box that's perfectly secure. Um, the more stories, um, some of which I've got confirmed through conversations with people I probably can't talk about, um, about Amazon employees looking inside of, of, um, of stuff on Amazon. And, um, you know, violations of privacy in the competitive room. Um, so that, that kind of people aren't comfortable having it on health and there's certainly going to be more of that. So the movement I think is away from centralization. It's going to be more about running your own thing, but you're going to need help because you can't run it yourself and keep it up to date and keep it without a system administrator. But that's largely been addressed by containerization and stuff like that. So what we're going to see is a bunch of decentralized, um, solutions and i think oxide is one of the first really substantial ones i mean it's only been around for two months at least i think it's less than that probably in fact if you read their blog i bet let's go see when their first one was their first post oh december okay uh, maybe i didn't hear about him as soon as i thought i did nope there it is no it was yeah it's one about it yeah yep on the metal teaser so uh 1201 um that's about, I think that's about when I heard about them. But again, this is all part of becoming a Prussian technology professional. That's my, my term for uh, being a, a professional with near clairvoyance in what's coming up and being able to, to know where to invest your time. Um, and I'm going to make a plug for that before I go take a break. So um, skillstack.io slash PTP. Um, this is a really quick and dirty um, take on this. It's a little bit too on the nose on some things and it needs to be updated. But this is my take on the things you need to learn to become a prescient technology professional. That means you can compare it to a surfer being able to see um, the wave cresting and know when to paddle and catch the wave and ride it because, and then know when to get off the wave and get on another one. Um, and there's some... Um, there's some important, um, there's some important uh, skills there that are not technology skills, but that means you know, watching streamers <laughs> and um, taking in information and being open, and blah blah blah. So with that, I'll I'll leave that. I just wanted to to put that up there. Um, if you are a PTP, you, I've been taking the task. At, actually, Sir Rick, are you there? Yeah, he's there. Um, he's like, I don't buy into this, and um. I love that. I love that people are challenging me on it. Um, I do think it's possible though. I think it's not just possible. It's required. If you, if you pick the wrong technology, you know, unless you're just doing it for fun, you're not going to make money in it. And there's going to be money in AWS for a very long time. I mean, that's not going anywhere. Right. But we'll just like IBM. I mean, you can make the case that Amazon is the new IBM. I mean, IBM is in massive decline and Amazon's going nowhere but up. And that's because they have the cloud offerings. The Amazon, I mean, uh, IBM very famously declared that they were the cloud leader. And I, I, everybody just laughed in their face. <laughs> I could probably find that. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was like, we are the leader. It's like, there's such a company that's used to declaring reality that when they are that clueless, 
<laughs> you know, you got to wonder, like, how can you be that clueless? I mean, and arrogant. Zero is to say, I'm mainly looking at AWS to learn from and add stuff to pad my resume with. Yeah. Um, and you should. I, if anything, this is what I would do. I would, in order to claim that you have AWS skills, um, I would, for, like, create an account for sure. I let me just say first of all, there's nothing at AWS that I would ever use that I need, um, other than Lambda, and Lambda I can use through. Um, so what I would suggest is is um, maybe writing uh, a Lambda function or using Lambda through Jamstack on Netlify, and then you can say that you've you've used it. Uh, I would never use their DNS. I hate it. Um, they they have a more powerful DNS solution than DigitalOcean, but it's just so hard to use. Um, but it's probably worth putting an app out there. Be careful. You try to you, you remove everything later though because you get charged for it, and I get notifications. I I deleted my last thing from AWS, and they keep sending me things like we tried to charge you fifty cents for your little thing that doesn't exist anymore. I'm like, well, what's up with that? Um, their interface is pretty complicated. Actually, to this day, I continue to get likes on the Medium post that helps helps. Um, set up just a basic um, AWS server over there. And there's a lot of little security gotchas. Um, there's a lot of people that have uh, fired up things on AWS and not done it right and had, and inadvertently left um, their sites wide open because it's so complicated. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if the thing about listing AWS on a job resume or something like that, um, I can see the draw for, for listing, say, hey, I've done it. I know how to use it if I need to. But I don't know that I would capitalize on that. I'm, I might not even list it unless I was really going to learn it. And if you're really going to learn it, you can pay their like four or five, eight hundred bucks or whatever and do their course and go through the thing. I mean, if you're going to play in that ecosystem, that's the way to do that. And there is a very solid certification path, which reminds me, what time is it? Yeah, I, I need to actually clip a video about certification again that's shorter than the one I did before. So the answer is, if you're going to do AWS at all, um, rather than list, oh, I played around with it, you know, at a bullet point, I would get a cert in it. And I would go through the work to get the cert. And um, stick that on your resume, even if even if it's going to fade away. They're going to say, well, that was years ago. What do you know now? And if, you, if you're concerned about people not hiring you because you don't have AWS skills, um, which is funny because that's a, that's the subject of a of an episode in Silicon Valley. Richard, who's brilliant, writes the compression algorithm, has no idea how to do cloud. <laughs> He's like, so they hire this, they hire this geeky little kid, to who's all about the cloud, and it, it you know pandemonium ensues. It's kind of funny. Um, so yeah, uh, so if you're gonna do cloud, I would get the cert. Because anybody who sees it on the resume is going to be immediately comparing you to someone else who's certified, and that's the whole Amazon ecosystem. So, if 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 you want that, I would I would do that. Um, what else? 